Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Reorg webinar series. Today we are lucky to have analysts from Wood & McKenzie to help us navigate the energy landscape as we dig into the producers facing distress, understand who is at risk and what their prospects are by understanding their assets a little better. We will also dig into the adjacent midstream companies as well. Please note that if you'd like to revisit this webinar later, a replay of today's discussion will be available on the Reorg Media page within 24 hours. I'm Mark Fisher, Director of Credit Research for America's Core Credit, and joining me on today's webinar are Head of uh, Covenants Peter Washwitz and special guests Alex Beaker and John Coleman, Principal Analyst at Wood McKenzie. Here is the agenda for the day. I'll start with a brief introduction, followed by Alex and John, who will take you through Wood McKenzie's proprietary financial health index, take a deep dive into some of the major U.S. basins, including how midstream operators are affected by distress in EMPs, and conclude with a discussion on some of the operators in distress, including cash flow profiles and company valuations. Then Peter will talk about certain covenant considerations operators and stakeholders should consider around M&A. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A widget, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. So let's get started. So to start, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the financial situation, liquidity situation of operators today. Uh, Pre-petition results from the spring redetermination period have been coming in over the last month, predominantly when companies report earnings. On average, results have been coming in consistent with projections, which reported on and, and had which we reported on and had called for about 20% plus decline for oil producers. However, there has been a lot of variability in results. While overall gas borrowing bases have been cut less than oil, we've still seen almost 50% declines in some cases. Plus, it's also likely that banks use the redetermination to eliminate some risk or dictate how companies spend capital, which at times has more to do with company than the assets itself. For instance, Battalion Oil and Oasis Petroleum both had their borrowing bases cut with step downs in subsequent months, which can be thought of as capping exposure but not causing a freefall. Chaparral Energy had its borrowing base cut to below what was outstanding, resulting in a required payback over a six-month period. Primary deals have been few and far between. CNX Resources was able to raise money, but in part due to hedges, the company, and also the company has a very strong cash flow profile. Plus, there has been more positive sentiment around natural gas. In addition, PDF Energy is a um, downstream player as well, which uh, people think prospects, prospects might be a little bit better. It's perhaps post-petition where we first saw the pullback in financing, which uh, I'd include in this category both money coming in from debtor and possession loans, but also new financings as part of a plan or acquisition from 363 sales. EP Energy was perhaps the first plan to fall apart when on March 19th, stakeholders including Apollo and the debtors mutually agreed to terminate their rights offering plan. Approach Resources has been trying to get the court to enforce its asset purchase agreement with Alpine Energy, accusing Alpine of seeking to escape its obligations to purchase the debtor's assets for $192.5 million. And service company Pioneer Energy announced an agreement with stakeholders this weekend on a revised plan which shifts a considerable amount of economics from note holders to pre-petition lenders. In April, we reported on nine energy companies with more than $10 million in liabilities that filed for Chapter 11, but none of them had requested access to a dip leading up to the first day hearing. Remember, energy companies need cash just to maintain production. Therefore, we could see more situations like Whiting Petroleum that without financing results in initial large outflow, cash outflows, followed by declining production as they live within current cash. So what do companies do to raise liquidity or hold on to the cash that they already have? Almost every company we cover has cut CapEx to extend runways, a number of launched distressed exchanges, and those that have hedges in place the commodity prices from earlier in the year are certainly in a better position. However, to raise cash, companies can monetize assets, including hedges or certain properties, or sell all of their assets. And of course, that can be done either in court or out of court. That's one of the things that we like to focus on today, the asset quality. But to think more about it just, uh, than just M&A. And also, as companies are forced to restructure or offer security in certain assets, we want to be able to separate the assets, the bad from the good. So to help us through that, I'm going to pass it over to Alex Speaker from Wood McKenzie. He's going to start by taking a look at Wood McKenzie's proprietary financial health index. Thanks, Mark. This is Wood McKenzie's financial health index. 
the index is out of, max, out of a maximum score of 10 possible points and includes things like a company's gearing ratio, weighted average bond price, current ratio, credit rating, any near-term debt maturities, as well as the, the net debt to Wood McKenzie NPV ratio. I generally think of this chart in three buckets. Uh, the first bucket is going to be on the right-hand side. If you draw an imaginary line from, call it QEP, over to the right-hand side, these are the companies that are going to be in the most financial distress. Obviously, we've already seen Whiting file for bankruptcy. Chesapeake could happen any day now. Um, these are the companies with generally worse assets and higher debt uh, profiles, which are provide, you know, proving to be a very uh, challenging environment uh, at current prices. The next bucket, I would draw a line from, say, Simerex over to QEP in the middle of the chart. These are the companies that could be uh, could go either way. It could be uh, if in a, you know, these would be the next in line um, for financial distress in a prolonged low price environment period. And then finally, the group on the left-hand side, the EOGs over to the marathons, these are going to be the companies uh, best positioned to weather the storm. Um, these, these companies will be okay even in a relatively longer prolonged uh, price downturn. They will find ways to innovate, uh, to reduce costs, and maintain some level of, of activity. These are the companies that we could potentially see get active um, on the M&A front over the next few months. Now this slide shows Wood McKenzie's financial health index on the x-axis and the current revolver utilization of each company on the y-axis. Each company circle is sized by their total net debt. As you can see with the companies on the right side of the chart, the companies that rank high in our financial health index also have near zero revolver utilization. The companies in the blue box are in the most difficult position this year. These are companies with poor financial health, high debt levels, and generally lower quality assets. As we'll see later on, most companies on this list are expected to outspend cash flow this year at an average $35 per barrel WTI oil price, and that's before hedging. Typically, the revolver is the first source of liquidity during periods of outspend. But because reserve value is declining with lower prices, banks are starting to cut back on the available credit extended to tight oil companies. April is when most borrowing bases are redetermined in the spring. Of the companies we've tracked, eight have seen their borrowing base cut, uh, four have been reaffirmed, but none have seen an increase to the borrowing base. As Mark mentioned earlier, SM's borrowing base was reduced by about 30%. Oasis saw its cut by about 50%. That will put, push the re revolver utilizations of those companies higher on this chart. As we saw with Whiting's bankruptcy, the company preemptively drew down $600 million of its available balance on the revolver just prior to filing Chapter 11. That money will help the, con the company continue to operate during bankruptcy process. These strategies are very important when considering the lower 48 macro supply picture. It may not mean Whiting production will grow over the next few months, but it will definitely help mitigate production declines. John will touch on more on that on the next slide. We'll take a look at what impact these lower production levels are having on the midstream sector. Thanks, Alex. I think one of the important things to draw attention to on the midstream side is the mantra that usually exists that midstream, the midstream space in general is going to be immune to volatility in commodity price swings as a lot of the contracts underpinning the assets are going to be uh, on a volume basis, and therefore, uh, regardless of price, midstream companies will be made whole whether that capacity is used or not. And I think there's some important caveats to mention before we dig into some of the fundamentals underlying uh, the midstream space today, and that's uh, the volatility in price is, only, is not going to impact midstream cash flows, but only to a certain threshold. So if the price moves so low that it curtails uh, incentive to grow production or even to shut in production like you're seeing today, uh, certain types of midstream contracts like acreage dedications uh, are going to be more exposed uh, in this environment where volume declines uh, on given acreage 
uh, are not flowing through midstream assets and therefore cash flows associated with those assets are set to decline in this kind of environment. And the other important caveat, obviously, is that if the price goes so low for an extended period of time, that the counterparty risk question starts to come into play uh, with a lot of the minimum volume commitments uh, type agreements uh, that are usually thought of as very stable. Uh, below a certain price threshold, those questions can be raised about counterparty risk and those things being renegotiated in potential bankruptcies. So those are two important things to understand in today's environment that both uh, production is being shut in and there is a significant risk, uh, like Alex highlighted, uh, for an extended period of time of low prices, that counterparty risk is going to be a bigger question. But quickly looking at the, the fundamentals underlying the midstream space today, uh, in our lower 48 crude and condensate production outlook, this is largely a proxy for uh, the available volumes to move through the lower 48 midstream system. And you can see in this, in this environment, growth has been stunted uh, largely across the entire uh, continent as you have uh, both production being shut in and a significant reduction in activity is causing production to roll off uh, over the next 18 to 24 months. That means uh, exposure on the asset, or excuse me, exposure on the acreage dedication side, which is largely a gathering and processing story, uh, and then even more so, um, uh, non-contracted long-haul assets are going to be significantly exposed over the next 18 to 24 months, with crude production expected to be uh, lower by 1.4 million barrels per day from March of this year to this month, and then continuing uh, a very sluggish recovery through the balance of next year. So continuing on the theme of crude midstream, uh, there's going to be uh, significant differences regionally within the lower 48 as this story rebounds into the back half of this year and, and through 2021, which will have direct read-throughs uh, to regional assets uh, and then the owners of those assets at the corporate level. Um, as you can see from this chart, this is showcasing um, major basin level uh, long-haul pipeline utilization on the crude side uh, with significant gyrations expected over the, the balance of the second quarter as shut-ins royal. Uh, you know, production availability to move through a lot of these pipelines uh, that's largely expected to abate into the third quarter of this year. But the rebound is going to be very different uh, across different regions in the lower 48 space. And the most notable standout you can see there is the light blue line there in the Permian Basin. Uh, and just the way to read this chart is that shaded blue band there is the utilization level associated with a balanced market. Uh, with, if the line occurs above that, uh, there's room for expansion because the market is underbuilt. And if the uh, line is below that shaded blue region, that's an overbuilt market, which is uh, a very bad position for midstream assets to be in because it creates a lot of uh, pressure on tariff rates and cash flow risk at recontract. And so the Permian Basin, despite being the growth engine of the lower 48 uh, and where a lot of investment has been focused uh, on both the upstream and midstream side in recent years, uh, we think it's going to be the most exposed uh, on the, coming out of this crisis and see uh, the most sanguine recovery across um, the entirety of the lower 48 space in terms of asset utilization. The reason for that is uh, twofold. You have um, stalling production growth, in our view, over the next 18 to 24 months, where previously, prior to the price collapse, uh, we had expected continued year-on-year -year, uh, strong growth out of the Permian Basin, really driving uh, the U.S. story. However, now in this price environment and roll-off in activity, we're expecting a much more flat trajectory uh, for Permian Basin production, uh, production over the next 18 to 24 months. And then secondly, you still have um, uh, capacity from the recent Permian Basin long-haul build-out boom coming online with two more pipes set to start up over the next 12 months that were under construction during the price collapse and are still expected to come online. So significant excess capacity being built uh, against the backdrop of very flat production trajectory uh, means that there's going to be significant underutilization of assets in the Permian Basin. What that means is Permian Basin uh, exposed midstream players like Plains All-American, for example, is going to see uh, significant hardship in terms of uh, pressure on their tariff rates uh, and risks when it comes to recontracting any contracts that might roll off over the next two to three years. Uh, so the Permian Basin screens as uh, a red flag area for any assets uh, on the crude side uh, that are exposed over the next 18 to 24 months. And dialing in a little bit further into the story of the Permian Basin, you can see on, on this chart, uh, the chart on the left that is, just the sheer magnitude of the overbuild with uh, 
uh, the bar stacks representing pipeline capacity versus our production outlook, which is that light blue line. You can see exiting 2021, there could be an excess of 3 million barrels per day of long haul capacity, uh, which is roughly 40% of uh, all capacity being unused, which is nearly uh, an unprecedented uh, level for the Permian Basin. So a lot of spare pipe to fill, which means a lot of competition amongst pipes uh, through uh, lower rates and therefore lower cash flows uh, trying to attract those spot barrels. Uh, but even within the Permian Basin, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that not all assets are equal. Uh, with corridors out of the Permian Basin into the Gulf Coast, uh, uh, demand and export centers, uh, Houston, Beaumont, Nederland, and Corpus Christi all have different stories to tell. Uh, with Houston screening, in our view, on a forecast basis, as the most well insulated from a contract uh, minimum volume basis. That's going to be your enterprise products partners and Magellan midstream predominantly dominating that that corridor uh, being the most uh, you know well capitalized and typically most conservative entities uh, in the midstream space uh, in the middle there is Corpus Christi which uh, that was the beneficiary of the latest midstream build up boom on the crude side with all capacity being built into that market however with these new pipes uh, some of the uh, Underpinning for those assets was done through acreage dedications, uh, which, as I discussed, is largely exposed in this environment. So you're uh, going to see some, some sanguine activity in Corpus Christi uh, bound systems, uh, which is largely going to be Plains All American, uh, to some extent, Philip 66, and um, private equity Aries management with the Epic pipeline. Uh, and then uh, Rounding out the bottom there is the Beaumont Nederland corridor, which is largely dominated by energy transfer. Uh, and we think that there's a lot of legacy capacity along that corridor that is uh, uncontracted and, and most exposed in this environment. And so dialing things back down into a company level view, we've adopted uh, the financial health index that Alex mentioned at the front of the presentation uh, from the upstream space uh, for the midstream sector and uh, tweaked a few internal metrics to make it more relevant uh, for the midstream space, uh, but a few notable things stand out here. Uh, the first of which is uh, really it's going to be your diversified asset uh, footprints uh, and large capitalization players that dominate the, the healthier end or the, uh, the, the left-hand side of this index, um, but that doesn't mean that they're immune to what's happening in this current environment. Uh, the notable example there is One Oak. Uh, which is uh, very much near the top in terms of financial health. However, uh, being that they're uh, extremely levered to what's happening in the Bakken in North Dakota, one of the most exposed production regions in the U.S. today, um, their borrowing base over the last three months has more than doubled as they got three months, or excuse me, 10-year notes done back in March at roughly 3% uh, interest rate uh, versus over 6% they just got done uh, a few weeks ago. So the exposure to um, basins is very relevant uh, in terms of how uh, uh, debt metrics are, and, and debt instruments are going to trade in this environment. Uh, also notable towards the top of that, as we mentioned, is Plains All-American, who is going to be overly exposed to what's happening in the Permian Basin, both on the long haul and on the gathering side. Uh, what you see happening uh, towards the weaker end of this uh, index, towards the right-hand side of the chart, is going to be your smaller capitalization gathering focused names. So as we mentioned, gathering is very much exposed in this environment as it's traditionally an acreage dedication type agreement. And as volumes roll off over the next 18 to 24 months, uh, companies are going to uh, emerge as more levered than they once thought coming into the year uh, with significant pressure on cash flows and potentially debt covenants coming into play uh, on some of those weaker names. Uh, but this is going to have a very asset by asset level specific story uh, based on the rock that's underlying it. So I'll hand the mic back over to Alex to talk a little bit more about asset level economics that underpin a lot of the production that's flowing on these midstream assets. Thanks, John. So you've heard us talk a lot about asset quality throughout this webinar, so we thought it'd be helpful to put some uh, numbers around what that actually means at a basin level. So this slide shows the profitability index ratio at a $35, $45, and $55 oil price for an average well in each of the ma major oil plays. It's safe to say that all drilling opportunities in the lower 48 are out of the money at current spot prices. Just to clarify, the PI ratio is the present value of future cash flows discounted at 10% divided by the initial investment of the well. So if the ratio is above one, it means drilling the well can be a profitable endeavor. 
as you can see on the chart, the Permian is the only region that can make money at $35 a barrel, but that every basin has at least a few locations that can generate a return at $45 a barrel. It's worth pointing out that these are basin-wide averages. All basins have some select areas that are economic at $35 a barrel, just like how all basins have fringe parts of the play that need $70 a barrel or higher to break even. As with the distressed DNPs that we've been looking at throughout this webinar, it almost always comes down to asset quality. It's much better to be a bad operator with good rock than a good operator with bad rock. If you recall back to the Financial Health Index, the first bucket I talked about, the companies most at risk of bankruptcy this year, none of those are Permian peer play companies. That's not to say that Permian companies are immune from bankruptcy risk, but that asset quality is hugely important when judging the overall health of the company. This chart can also provide some insight into what prices we need to see in order to see a recovery in drilling and completion activity. I think we need to see well north of $45 a barrel before we see rigs added back in a meaningful way. The highest number we've seen given, given on earnings calls comes from Hess in the Bakken. The company has just recently dropped from six rigs to one rig in the play, uh, and it said it would need $50 a barrel for a sustained period of time before it would consider adding back a rig. The company is drawing down some duck inventory this year, that's drilled but uncompleted well inventory, which should help mitigate production line declines. Um, but the bottom line is much higher prices are needed for lower 48 tight oil to be considered in a good spot. Now, instead of looking at asset quality by basin, let's look at it at a company level. Here we've plotted 2020 free cash flow after hedging and corporate expenses. These are Wood McKenzie modeled, modeled figures. Before we get into the chart, I think it's worth pointing out how drastic the CapEx cuts have been over the past two months. Since the price downturn, most companies have cut CapEx by 30 to 50%. The response has been rapid, and we've seen that reflected in the weekly recount data. Shale is finally behaving the way shale was intended to behave. That's flexible and, and very short cycle investments. Cuts of this magnitude were absolutely the right move, but balance sheets will still be tested this year. Every company with the exception of Apache and Continental are outspending cash flow before hedging this year. Apache and Continental are only in that position because they pulled back so aggressively on investment as a result of their lack of hedging books. Uh, it's not necessarily a sign that their assets are better than their peers. The thing that immediately jumps out to you when you look at this chart is the value of hedge books across the board. EOG, Concho, Avenitiv, Occidental, and Hess are all generating over a billion dollars this year from their tactical hedging programs. This is proving to be a lifesaver in this market. So most companies will actually be okay this year, outside of the ones that ranked uh, very low on our financial health index that we looked at earlier. However, hedge books drop off significantly in 2021. So there will be much more pain felt across the peer group if prices stay low into next year. That's why the duration of this downturn is critical. Recall from the previous slide, most parts of the Permian need at least $35 a barrel to generate a 10% rate of return. So if we do stay in this $25 to $30 price environment, we should expect to see very, very minimal levels of drilling and completion activity continue into next year. The other thing to consider is how will production curtailments affect cash flow? Many companies on this chart are shutting in 30% or more of production in May because there's no storage available or the uh, wells do not um, generate enough money to uh, surpass their cash operating expenses. So our view is that these curtailments start to resume flowing in June, but if this is something that continues further into the summer, obviously that would have a large negative impact on the cash flow numbers you see here. Now let's take a look at what potential M&A could look like for the tight oil sector this year. This chart shows current enterprise values overlaid with Wood McKenzie PDP and PDP plus PUD valuations we can gather some implications for future M&A from this chart. The blue bar represents the value of just flowing production at $35 a barrel. 
This assumes no future drilling because as we saw earlier, almost all inventory is out of the money at $35. The yellow dashed line represents the full company value at $60 a barrel. At that price, most inventory moves back into the money, so we assume it gets drilled. The blue dot then represents the current enterprise value uh, of the company. So the reason we plotted it like this is because uh, the PDP value at $35 a barrel, that's more or less where the forward curve um, has, has leveled off. This seems to be the price, I would think of this as the lowest price a company would be willing to sell for um, because that flowing production value is, is very known. It's, it's pretty certain. On the flip side, the PUD plus PDP value at $60 a barrel is more or less the highest price a buyer would be willing to pay for a company in an upside scenario, unless they held a view that prices are going materially higher than $60 a barrel. So we're showing most enterprise values are currently near the bottom of the barrel. The market is assigning very little value to future inventory. If a company had a long-term constructive view of the macro environment, there can certainly be deals to be had right now. But if you're an EOG, what's the point of acquiring, say, QEP or Oasis or Whiting assets in this environment? The market is really not going to reward that type of deal. EOG's top concern is preserving its pristine balance sheet and credit rating. Acquiring a distressed company with high debt does not help it achieve those goals. The company's best position to weather the storm are not interested in acquiring lower tier, higher cost assets even if it comes at a great discount. If we see any deals happen in this environment, it's probably two relatively healthy companies or companies that have high financial health index scores with good assets coming together to further lower their cost structure and enhance their competitive edge on the market. So to start on M&A and before I hand it over to Peter, who's going to talk about covenant considerations outside of uh, bankruptcy, just wanted to quickly review um, what, what, what do you do to sell assets in bankruptcy? Uh, one of the most common ways is through Section 363. Uh, it's a way to sell assets free and clear of liens, claims, and interest. Uh, however, like most uh, situations in bankruptcy, there's a potential for objections uh, here from lien holders, JV partners, network and interest owners. Sometimes proceeds are kept in a segregated account pending lien litigation. Uh, and the top of the webinar, I mentioned approach resources and the delay in, um, in closing that sale. So for more on this, I would encourage everyone to listen to our webinar. Uh, that we did uh, talking about bankruptcy considerations for oil and gas companies. Uh, it was on April 8th and is on the Reorg site. Uh, so now uh, I'll pass it over to Peter, who will talk about uh, the covenant considerations related to M&A outside of bankruptcy. For the most part, most of these EMP companies have uh, relatively simple capital structures. They have a senior secured um, revolving facility that is typically secured by 85 to 90 percent of their approved oil reserves. And then they have a number of series of unsecured notes. And obviously some will have secured notes as well, but typically they generally have the, uh, the revolver and the unsecured notes. Um, whereas the revolvers will generally provide these companies flexibility to sell assets or transfer assets to unrestricted subsidiaries or, or you know, form joint ventures if uh, certain minimum liquidity requirements can be met. The senior notes are, you know, very common uh, high yield bonds that 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 include typical uh, restrictions on asset sales and restrictions on uh, transfers to unrestricted subsidiaries and joint ventures. So, depending on the transaction structure, these EMP companies will need to ensure that they have sufficient capacities, particularly under their notes, under the unsecured notes, in order to consummate a, a proposed tra transaction. Uh, under both the revolver and the uh, unsecured notes. Uh, companies can generally sell assets as long as they're done at fair market value and they receive 75% cash consideration. Um, the proceeds can usually be used to repay either outstanding revolving borrowings or any series of senior unsecured notes, or they can be reinvested in the business. Um, the RBL facilities, which actually generally do not require the company to use the proceeds for any specified purpose, 
they may require that the borrowing base is automatically reduced if a certain percentage of the borrowing base properties um, have been subject to the sale. Uh, in most uh, revolving facilities, it's usually um, if the sale involves a borrowing base assets in excess of 5% of the borrowing base, the borrowing base will generally be uh, required to uh, automatically be reduced. So while the asset sale will bring in cash, um, they may reduce, uh, you know, the sales may reduce liquidity under the, under the revolver. Uh, now, the, the, one of the more important points, and especially in uh, this period where a lot of these companies, uh, e even secured and unsecured notes, are trading at, you know, well below, uh, you know, 50 cents on the dollar, um, asset sale proceeds under the notes typically have to be used to pay down the notes at par. Um, where while well, some notes do allow for um, uh, asset sale proceeds to be used to pay down the notes at market prices, uh, most do require par pay down. So um, to the extent the company wants to use asset sale proceeds to reduce debt, uh, they're not really going to gain a huge amount of, uh, of, of, uh, of deleveraging uh, since they're going to have to repay these notes that are trading at uh, you know, below par prices for par. So just a consideration to, uh, to think about. Another potential source of liquidity for some of these companies would be to uh, drop assets down into an unrestricted subsidiary or a joint venture. Um, now, while I, I, I typically will caution that unrestricted subsidiary transfers are, are fairly rare, uh, I've only been done a handful of times, um, there are three notable situations of uh, EMP companies that have had unrestricted subsidiaries. Um, Chesapeake Energy had their uh, the Brazos Valley unrestricted subsidiary, which they just merged back into the restricted group. Sanchez Energy had an unrestricted subsidiary structure, and I believe Sable Permian was another one. So while they are unlikely, um, they have come up uh, from time to time in the E&P industry. Um, anyway, for unrestricted subsidiary or JV transfers, companies are going to need to have sufficient investment capacity to consummate these transfers. Uh, typically, under uh, in the notes, they'll have builder baskets, uh, general investment baskets, general RP baskets, and usually uh, spe specific baskets for uh, investment in the unrestricted subsidiaries and joint ventures. Uh, again, in the revolvers, if, if the company can meet a minimum liquidity test, uh, typically there will not be restrictions on these types of transfers. Um, just like asset sales, if the companies were to transfer a certain amount of borrowing base properties, um, the, the revolver may require that the borrowing base be reduced by the amount of the transfers. And um, to the extent these companies transfer EBITDA producing assets, the company's EBITDA under their debt documents uh, will, will be reduced by the amount of transferred EBITDA. Um, and, of course, the lower EBITDA could implicate uh, financial covenants under the revolving facilities. Um, so, again, um, probably unlikely that um, most of these companies, most companies in distress right now will create these unrestricted subsidiary structures. Um, it has been done in the past. And that concludes the slide portion of our presentation. Please make sure you have submitted your questions as we will now switch over to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Note that a replay of today's presentation will be posted on the Reorg Media page within the next 24 hours. Great, thanks. Uh, let's, let's see uh, what has come in so far and um, going through. First, it looks like the first question is going to be for Alex, if you could get this one. Uh, which companies or areas of the lower 48 are most susceptible to production curtailment? Yeah, thanks, Mark. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so just looking at it from an operating cost perspective, generally the Bakken sits behind the Permian Eagleford uh, VidCon just because of its proximity to the to um, you know end markets. So so the cost to operate the, that production is a little bit higher. But we you know no basin is immune to curtailments in this environment. We've seen companies in the Permian Eagleford everywhere um, announce that they're shutting in. What really matters more is the availability of storage. So take, for example, within the Bakken, you have two different, very different strategies between Continental and HEP. Uh, Continental shutting in 160,000 barrels of oil equivalent. Um, not all of that probably coming to the Bakken, but a good chunk of it. And on the, on the other end of the spectrum, you saw HEP announce this quarter that they're shutting in uh, zero barrels uh, this quarter. They actually chartered three 
VLCCs, very large crude carriers, uh, to store up to 2 million barrels of oil uh, through this summer, and they plan to sell it in the fourth quarter of this year. They've already locked in higher prices given where the forward curve sits. So that should net them, you know, a few extra dollars per barrel, but obviously a very, um, you know, involved process in getting, you know, finding the storage and storage, you know, those ships are obviously um, very high cost right now. So it's not necessarily guaranteed profit, um, but but it really varies. And yeah, as, as we said, you know, it can vary a lot between companies, vary a lot between basins. Great, thanks. And uh, John, uh, here's one on midstream. Uh, if, if, uh, how are midstream companies broadly responding in this environment? And could we see a fundamental shift in the high distribution business model going forward? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think that's uh, a question on everybody's mind today that's uh, focused on the midstream space. So, I mean, midstream companies today are responding pretty much in line with how you would expect. You've seen uh, distribution cuts largely across the board uh, with some of the uh, the weaker balance sheet players out there. I think 20 cuts uh, is, is the last count that I've seen um, with, you know, even the stronger players just uh, opting to maintain a, a flat distribution. Um, and then even beyond that, uh, you've seen a, a significant uh, reduction in growth capital spending for this year, which, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense just given the, the trajectory of where um, all commodity uh, production is expected to go over the next two years. You're, you're unlikely to need additional capacity across the energy system in the U.S. Uh, over the next couple of years. So um, a bit surprised we haven't seen more reduction in growth capital spending uh, to this point um, because it would, it would appear um, – growth capital spending reductions are being met uh, very positively in the equity markets. Um, but, you know, as for a change in, in the business model, that's, you know, that's a tough one to pin down because traditionally the investor base of these midstream companies has largely been uh, income seeking uh, type investors uh, that, that buy into these for uh, the high level of distribution relative to what you can get from, you know, your, your traditional treasury bond. So it's tough to see that transition happen broadly, but you did start to see glimmers of changes happen before uh, the price collapse, where some of the uh, you know leaders at the forefront of uh, capital allocation thinking in the industry uh, started to move into a self-funding model, uh, where they would self-fund uh, through a retained cash flow uh, the the equity portion of their uh, capital needs. Um, and then even uh, towards the end of 2019, you saw uh, some uh, companies, uh, enterprise products partners, Magellan, Midstream, uh, begin to offer the idea of uh, share buybacks um, as w one form of capital deployment, which could see a greater share of shareholder return in the future as, you know, the, the constant growth, um, uh, you know, expectations behind the distribution uh, definitely pin uh, Midstream management down in terms of capital allocation and sometimes lead them to uh, partake, uh, you know, poor return investments just to generate additional income uh, to keep the distribution growth going. So, you know, kind of misaligning the, the incentives of management there. So I think from that standpoint, there's certainly, um, you know, uh, rationale uh, for an augmentation of the business model. Uh, but based on what we saw after the price collapse in 2016, uh, you know, similar uh, story played out with massive distribution cuts. Uh, and significant loss in investor trust, but no real significant change uh, to the business model after that. So uh, I guess that's one uh, to be seen in, in coming quarters and years. Thanks, John. Uh, Peter, I, I think this looks like a covenant-related question, uh, asking about JVs, uh, who has done them, and what's the process in terms of uh, doing a joint venture? Um, I'm, I'm not actually sure about the, the joint ventures. I, I think with the unrestricted subsidiaries, um, th those are the ones I had mentioned. It was um, it was Chesapeake, it was EPN, or, uh, not EPN, it was uh, uh, Sanchez um, and uh, Sable Permian and um, and Chesapeake. I mean, all, all you really need to do is just create an unrestricted subsidiary. Uh, you just form a subsidiary that is not part of the restricted group, um, and then it's not subject to any of the covenants in the debt documents. Um, you, you know, you've seen this in, in, in PetSmart and J. Crew and a lot of retailers, but what it allows you to do is you can kind of transfer assets to these uh, entities that are not subject to any of the restrictions, um, and, and these subsidiaries can then raise uh, debt uh, secured on these transferred assets. 
and, and they can do whatever they want with those uh, with the proceeds. So they can either you know repay the company's debt um, using kind of cheaper debt themselves since it's not part of the over levered uh, structure, or it, you know it can pay a dividend to the sponsor. But I think that's not really kind of the consideration with these companies. It's it's mostly you know kind of maybe transferring the good assets to a uh, to a kind of new capital structure and just not really starting over, but, you know, not having to deal with all these problems of the over leverage structure. So it, it really just gives them uh, a lot of flexibility and the process to do it is not particularly complicated. It's you form a subsidiary and just and transfer assets using uh, whatever capacity you're allowed under the documents. Thanks. Um, and uh, John, I got another midstream question for you. Um, do you do you see midstream and M&A opportunities arising similarly to E&P in the future? Are the large public players the natural buyer, or is it PE? Yes, I think um, it's a natural question to ask in this environment. And I think what you've seen uh, in recent history, at least as it relates to the midstream space, is that uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, much more broadly take the form of asset-level transactions rather than total corporate um, consolidations. Now, that, that's not to say that uh, you won't see any of that. Um, you know, you, the most recent one we can point to is Energy Transfer's acquisition um, of SEM Group. Um, and Energy Transfer has been highly acquisitive in the past. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me to see uh, them being active similarly based on recent history. But I think uh, more broadly, the way to think about it is you're going to see a number of midstream players that are going to uh, be over-levered relative to where they expected to be uh, coming into 2020 and looking to divest assets uh, in order to reduce leverage in this environment. Um, and that will take the form of, uh, you know, uh, divesting non-core assets and trying to uh, core up the portfolio. And in that environment, you've traditionally seen uh, some midstream uh, entities take interest there, but largely it's been uh, private equity that's come in um, because they're willing to pay uh, those higher multiples uh, for some of these assets and uh, mid traditional midstream players tend to shy away from that. So that would be something I'd ex expect to see is asset level transactions with uh, still significant interest uh, from the private equity space. Great. And back to EMP, Alex, if you want to take this one, how will minimum volume commitments hold up during this EMP downturn? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've we've spoken to a number of operators who have told us that they um, are willing to pay, you know, at least a few million in penalties this year to avoid drilling such uneconomic wells. So, you know, we're expecting to see some renegotiation between the upstream and the midstream sector, you know, things like, um, you know, contracts that have acreage dedication agreements rather than minimum volume. Um, would be, you know, good for both sides at this point. Um, but, you know, it's, it's in the midstream's interest to work uh, with the upstream company because, you know, they, they don't want to um, see that partner go, go bankrupt and volumes decline um, even more significantly into the future. So, yeah, we're expecting a lot of renegotiations um, at, at that point. Thanks. And, uh, Peter. Um, one on QEP specifically. QEP seems to be on the cusp of good versus bad company. Uh, what will it take for them to avoid becoming part of the bad group? Are they facing any challenges with covenants? Um, yeah, so EMPs, uh, sorry, I keep saying EMP. Uh, Q and P, uh, Q, uh, QEP's uh, debt documents are relatively flexible. Um, you know, they don't, they don't uh, restrict the company from incurring um, unsecured debt, and generally there is there are not many uh, restrictions on investments. However, um, their revolver includes uh, three maintenance covenants. One is a capitalization ratio, 60% uh, ratio of funded debt to capitalization. Uh, one is a 3.75 uh, times total net leverage ratio, and one is a present value uh, coverage ratio. Uh, the company's in compliance with all three of these, but because um, its uh, PB10 has declined uh, so significantly recently, um, it's kind of bumping up against the uh, present value coverage, which um, requires the company to um, have to, to ensure that the present value of its proved reserves exceeds its funded debt by one and a half times. Um, if you if you take away that covenant, the, the company has uh, the ability to incur about $821 million of, of total debt under their total leverage ratio. 
but with the present value coverage ratio, they, they could only incur another $240 million or so of debt. So um, the company is now fully on the, it's unable to draw fully on its revolver. It has a one and a quarter billion uh, revolver, which, is, which was undrawn as of March 31st. Uh, but it can now only access $239 million of the commitments before it, uh, it breaches that covenant. So um, I think the problem with, with QEP is, is probably one of liquidity, at least from a, from a debt document point of view. Um, you know, it, again, it's relatively flexible ability. Uh, debt lien covenants and investment covenants don't really restrict it. But the maintenance covenants are, are really are going to hamper its liquidity as um, it can only draw the $240 million of its uh, one and a quarter uh, billion revolver. So I think that's probably the, the main problem. And again, if, you know, if uh, oil prices continue to decline and its PV10 uh, you know, gets even lower, um, obviously the, 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 availability under the, under the, the limited availability of the revolver um, is going to further decrease. Thanks. And Alex, um, storage constraints. Uh, everybody uh, knows that well now, having seen uh, the first negative uh, oil price, uh, regardless of the reason. Uh, question on, um, on it uh, related to it. It seems like cash costs are well below current oil prices. How real is the storage constraint? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so most of the companies during earnings have said that they're shutting in production because of prices as opposed to storage. However, from a macro perspective, we know there's very little storage in the market. So we're trying to reconcile those two messages here. It's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, the duration of, of low prices can affect the decision to shut in or not. Um, as, as we saw, you know, we flirted with negative prices, but that was only very temporary. We're already back to, you know, call it $25 a barrel on the front month contract. So, you know, a, a company's willing to deal with negative operating expenses if it avoids them the hassle of having to shut in a large number of wells and then bring them back on soon, soon after. Um, so, you know, you are negative, but, you know, things are starting to look a little bit better. Um, I may uh, pull in John here to chat more about the storage constraint part. Yeah, happy to, Alex. So I think a, a few talking points around uh, what we are seeing on the storage side is the first uh, and most important factor I think to point out is uh, all indications are that the worst of the storage, if you want to call it a crisis, uh, is behind us, that uh, fundamentals are starting to uh, indicate that the market is approaching balance. And you're seeing that from all kinds of leading indicators, uh, storage just being one of them with uh, slowing rates of build, both onshore and offshore. So, but that's not going to be the case universally across the board, as there's still going to be regional pockets that are going to be more exposed to others. And also, there's going to be a crude quality uh, question around storage as well. Uh, for those that might not be as familiar, uh, there's a wide range of crude qualities that's produced in the U.S., uh, some being very light, which is somewhat low quality, and then your traditional WTI grade, which is kind of a, a, a middle uh, a middle range uh, crude or a, a lower end of the light spectrum, if you will. Um, what that means is that if you're producing that ultra light grade of crude, a lot of that comes from the Permian Basin and the Eagle Herd. There's not a lot of dedicated storage readily available uh, for those grades of crude if you don't have uh, a ready buyer, uh, which is what we saw draw very significantly and very rapidly in the month of April. So even though there might have been storage available, that doesn't mean your barrel was a match for that storage. So you saw uh, more exposed players in the Permian Basin and the Eagle Ford that had that lighter API production as well. So there's a lot of nuances that go into that, but I, I think the key takeaway here is that looking forward, uh, as long as producers don't rush to reopen wells and uh, flood the market with new production, uh, that it appears uh, storage levels are, are uh, reaching a plateau phase and then, and then likely to uh, tip into a deficit and draw down uh, perhaps as soon as the third quarter. Great, thanks. And um, Sue, one more question. Uh, Alex, on DES presented, is this before or after any ongoing expected restructuring, including cost optimization exercises? Yeah, I would say I would say that's before any ongoing um, expected restructuring, it, b before further cost optimization. Um, I think there's the cost curve has fallen dramatically over the past five years. 
Part of that is coming from lower pricing from oil field service companies, and a good part of it has come from just greater efficiencies, drilling wells faster, um, having more of a manufacturing mentality in in the Permian. Um, so there, there's a lot of questions on how much lower the cost curve can go. You know, we think we're we're pretty near the bottom in tight oil. Keep in mind, oil field service sector is is very stressed at the po- at this point. Um, upstream can't um, lean on them any further for lower pricing. Um, But we have seen some companies come out this quarter and say they've improved their uh, drilling costs, the drilling speed continues to improve, um, and that type of thing. So, you know, as we've seen in the past five years, the sector always finds a way to innovate and drive that cost lower. So so certainly don't count them out yet. Great. Thank you. Uh, Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank Alex and John for presenting with us today and to Wood McKenzie also for partnering with us in this webinar. And of course, thanks as always, Peter. If we haven't gotten to your questions, we will get back to you offline. If you have a few minutes, please take the survey that will appear on your screen in a few moments. Your feedback is, of course, very important to us. And finally, please be sure to join us next week on May 19th to 10 a.m. for the second installment of the Reoregon Wood McKenzie webinar series. Our teams will provide an outline of the latest in oil and gas credit markets and the bankruptcy and covenant considerations for ENPs. Thank you for your time today and stay safe.